Good evening. I'm Harriet Hamasi, University Librarian at Brown, and tonight's program is brought to you by the Brown University Library and the Friends of the Library. Before we begin tonight's interview, and I know you're already bored, I have the honor of presenting to each of our uh, special guests, Tom Doherty and George R. R. Martin, the Harris Collection Literary Award. The idea for this award originated with the Friends of the Library this year and was inspired by the library's Harris Collection of American Poetry and Plays. This world-class collection established by Caleb Fisk Harris, Brown Class of 1838, celebrates the influence of literature in popular culture. Could there be better first-time recipients of this award? Tom Doherty is a respected leader in the field of publishing who founded his own company in 1980 and published, among other things, Tor Books, now a subsidiary of Macmillan Publishers. Tor has won the Locus Magazine poll for best science fiction publisher since 1988 and is described as the most successful science fiction and fantasy publisher in the world. George R. R. Martin is the number one New York Times bestseller author of many novels, including the acclaimed series A Song of Ice and Fire, on which the HBO program Game of Thrones is based. As a writer, producer, he has worked on The Twilight Zone, Beauty and the Beast, and just a little on The Game of Thrones. <laughs> Tom and George have enjoyed a long history of collaboration, which I'm sure we'll learn more about tonight. But first, the awards. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. It's nice coming to an award ceremony where I know I'm going to win. <laughs> very tired of losing Emmys every year. Now I have a little housekeeping to take care of. Um, you have your tickets in hand, I hope, and these tickets have a special meaning, not only because they allowed you entrance to tonight's program, but because they will also give you access to a book, uh, Dangerous William, Women, Volume 1, that is compliments of Tor Books and Tom. So thank you very much. <laughs> I think this is the best kind of housekeeping. In order for you to claim your book, please come to The Rock, to the administrative offices, uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m., and beginning tomorrow. Tonight's interview, at last, will be conducted by Professor Lynn Joyrich and author John Land, who have joined us on stage. Professor Joyrich, teaches courses on cultural criticism, film studies, and television studies in the Department of Modern Culture and Media at Brown. She is the author of Reviewing Reception, Television, Gender, and Postmodern Culture, and co-author, co-editor, excuse me, of the journal Camera Obscura. Lynn has also written a number of articles and chapters, including a recent work that discusses the program Game of Thrones. This document will be included in a forthcoming second edition of New Media, Old Media, A History and Theory Reader. Providence residents John Land graduated from Brown in 1979, magna cum laude and phi beta kappa.
with a degree in English and American literature. He is the USA Today best-selling author of 36 novels, including the award-winning Caitlin Strong series, the most recent entry of which is Strong Darkness. John is also a very active Friends of the Library member and was instrumental in helping put together tonight's program. Please join me in welcoming our guest and our interviewers. It's always nice to start at the beginning, and I need to test just as a small intro, very quick. I was not introduced, obviously, to George R. R. Martin with the song of Fire and Ice. I've met him as an author for the first time in a pair of books he did in the 80s. One was a book called Fever Dream, one of the best vampire novels I've ever read about vampires in the Mississippi River before anybody else was writing vampire books before Stephen King. And this one, this is the original first edition you can see from the <laughs> dust. This is a book I've read four or five times. There aren't many that I, that I count like that. It's a rock and roll horror story that to me, it's one of the books that made me want to be a writer. Honestly, that's how well written it is. You need to take better care of your book. I know. It's <laughs> Speaking of the beginning, there's a quote that you gave in 2014. The first scene, chapter one of the first book, the chapter where they find the dire wolf pups, just came to me out of nowhere. I was at work on a different novel, and suddenly I saw that scene. It didn't belong in the novel I was writing, but it came to me so vividly. They had to sit down and write it, and by the time I did it, it led to a second chapter, and the second chapter was the Caitlin chapter, where Ned had just come back. Was this series that begot the, the TV series Game of Thrones, would you call it a happy accident? Oh, I don't know I'd call it an accident. Um, you know, I, I, I know some writers talk about inspiration that comes to them in, in, in these, these uh, very almost mystical terms about, uh, you know, muses and, and uh, uh, inspiration coming to you from strange places. I, I, it comes from us. It, it comes from the subconscious, whether right brain or left brain or some some brain. Uh, but it it is part of me. I mean, I, I read things, I digested things. That idea was buried somewhere, but it came to the surface. And I, I don't know what makes it come to the surface. Uh, I don't know where. You know, you get off, asked often, uh, where do your ideas come from? And sometimes, you know, sometimes there's a specific incident or an inspiration that generates an idea, but 90% of the time, you, you don't know. It's just there's suddenly there's an idea, and sometimes a whole story or a scene. And it wasn't there yesterday, but today it's there. And uh, where did it come from? I don't know. But I'm certainly glad that they keep coming, because you're in trouble if they stop coming one of these days. Tom, in introducing you a few years back at when you were the featured speaker at an International Thriller Writers Thriller Fest event, Steve Barry said the following, Tom Doherty is almost single-handedly responsible for moving science fiction and fantasy from the back corner of the bookstore to the New York Times bestseller list. Without him, HBO may never have gotten the opportunity to make Game of Thrones. But I've also gotten the feeling that you and this whole, this love of this genre was somewhat of an accident as well. Well, actually, things went way back. Uh, long before I started tour, I was sales manager of the pocketbook division of Simon & Schuster. Ballantyne was an independent publisher, which we distributed. So I was sales manager for Ian and Betty Ballantyne when they launched the very first fantasy line ever presented. It's kind of funny the way we presented it. We said, you know, at that time, people thought fantasy was just for kids. And we said we were going to launch an adult fantasy line. I think if we said that today, we'd <laughs> have a better <laughs> understand. <laughs> but, but we did. And we launched it with uh, things like uh, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And they were such a publishing phenomena that they proved to booksellers mm. that fantasy belonged in the front of the store. You know, Ian, Ian and Betty were special people. They had started American Penguin, 
as a uh, sub-company of British Penguin. They built that through World War II. Then Penguin, who had been hurt in World War II, decided that they really should export books, that they needed to have American Penguins sell, sell their books. And the Ballantines didn't want to do that. They wanted to continue to publish for the American public. So they put a group together. In those days, people, uh, paperback publishing, mass market, and hardcover publishing were two different, uh, two different kinds of thing. These books, which were everywhere, from the Walmart to the Kmart, you know, in those days, the, the uh, Walgreen to the Woolworth, in supermarkets, drugstores, newsstands, airports. These books were licensed from hardcover publishers. They came out a year after the hardcover publisher published it. Ian and Betty put a group of hardcover publishers together to form a line which would reprint their books a year after the hardcover publication. They got 10% of that for uh, putting it together. The line was Bantam, which ultimately became the biggest of the mm -hmm. mass market publishers. Mm -hmm. Ian and Betty built it to the point where they could sell their 10% and start Ballantine. Betty had always loved science fiction and fantasy. Amazing woman. She had been editor-in-chief of Penguin, Bantam, and Ballantine before she turned 30. You just don't see anybody that accomplished very often. She had a dream to do science fiction and fantasy lines, and she did them at Ballantine. And I was lucky enough to be their sales manager. And they were generous enough with their time. They mentored me. They taught me things that I could use when later it became my chance to be a publisher. So speaking of fantasy, this question is for you, George. So you've worked as a screenwriter for TV, uh, including on such really important fantasy shows as Beauty and the Beast uh, and The Twilight Zone. So how would you say that that screenwriting experience affects your writing, both for your novels and for your TV work? And you know, can you tell us about that TV work? What, what is your role? on the TV series, and what possibilities do you think television allows or maybe prohibits? Well, that covers a lot of ground. That's a big answer. Um, you know, my, my television career almost came about by accident. Uh, although I watched a lot of television as a kid growing up, I, I began with as a prose writer, selling short stories to magazines and selling my first novels. Um, you know, I, I was through the early 70s and into the late 70s and uh, the early 80s. I was a hot young star in science fiction and fantasy and horror, each book doing better than the one before, winning Hugos and Nebulas. Um, until I published that fourth book, the, <laughs> the one that John has held up, The Armageddon Reg, um, which got me my biggest advance yet, was supposed to be my first bestseller. Um, and it was a total commercial failure. Nobody, nobody bought it. And I discovered that uh, like almost overnight, my career as a publisher, as a novelist, seemed to be over. Uh, I couldn't sell my fifth novel. Um, I sold a short story collection, Tough Voyaging, a fix-up for like a tenth of the money that I'd gotten for the Armageddon rag. So it was almost like I was having to start all over. Um, but oddly enough, the same book that closed off my career as a novelist, opened my door to Hollywood because Armageddon Rank was optioned for a feature film by a guy named Phil Daguerre. He never got the feature made, although he tried for years. He wrote several screenplays. But Phil was also the television showrunner and, and creator who had done Simon Simon and some other hit shows. And uh, CBS came to him and said, well, we want more hit shows from you, Phil. What do you want to do next? He said, I want to bring back the Twilight Zone. And when he did, uh, he gave a lot of script assignments to science fiction, mm -hmm. fantasy, prose writers, people without any television or screenwriting experience whatsoever, which is very unusual. Um, and I was one of the lucky guys, because he knew me through our association on Armageddon Rag. And they liked the first script I wrote, and next thing I knew, I wound up on staff there. I did five scripts for Twilight Zone, a couple for Max Headroom that were never produced. Then I went on to be a staff on Beauty and the Beast for three years of that show. 
Uh, and then after that, I did five years of development doing pilots. So basically, I spent a decade in, in television and film. I think it did, when I came back to prose, I came back with tools and techniques that I had picked up from television that I think helped me as a novelist and, uh, and a prose writer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that people seem to like a lot in Ice and Fire is the way each chapter leaves you wanting more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a television technique. Yeah, that, that's a chapter. technique of the act break that I learned by working in television. You know, yeah. when, when you're gonna, you know, you, you got a television show going on and you're gonna have to cut to a commercial for, you know, beer or <laughs> cars or, you know, whatever. Uh, you want them not to change the channel. So you, you end with an act break. And it, it can be a cliffhanger, but it's an oversimplification to say it's always cliffhangers. It's a, a resolution of something or an introduction of a new element or a twist, just something really interesting to end the, uh, the chapter with or the act with. Mm -hmm. And I applied that, that technique mm -hmm. to Game of Ice and Fire. So at the end of every chapter, there's, there's something. There's a, a, a twist, a turn, a resolution. Um, an introduction of a new complication that will hopefully leave you wanting to find out what happens to Tyrion in the next chapter. But of course, I don't give that to you. Uh, <laughs> then you have to read about Arya, or then you have to, and then you're you're left at the end of the Arya chapter wanting to know what's going to be next for Arya. But now you have to deal with Jon Snow. So, <laughs> you know, that's a television to technique. I also think the years in television improved my dialogue. Um, if you compare my earlier novels, people were much more likely to give long, windy speeches. And uh, of course, that's very discouraged in television or film. You know, some of, the, some of the directors and the producers will just look at a page. They won't even read the dialogue. But if there's a big block that someone is giving a Shakespearean monologue, they hate it already. They want, they want little two-line ping-ponging back and mm. kind of back and forth. And that's actually a better way. It's a livelier way to, uh, to do dialogue. And it certainly had some influence on me in, in that regard. Structure, too, you know. William Goldman in his classic oh. book, Adventures in the Screenplay, said yeah. that he had two proverbs there that I took to heart. One is, uh, structure is everything, and uh, the other one is, uh, nobody knows anything. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> so those are both true, oddly enough. Uh, Great, thanks. Writing for the uh, LA Times in 2011, Ned Viceni said, with Robert Jordan, this is with reference to the popularity first of Game of Thrones, but then the entire series. With Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time saga, a hot commodity, publishers entered a fierce bidding war for what was then conceived as the Song of Ice and Fire trilogy. Tom, you published Robert Jordan all the way up until his death, and now another author has taken over, um, I don't know if it, Brendan, Brendan Sanderson. Sanderson. Yep. How did you find and how did you come by Robert Jordan? And well, you can, even if you want to get into how you founded Tor Books. Well, I guess I would kind of have to, to, to get into Robert Jordan. The way I founded Tor Books, to go back to the beginning, I did all the sales jobs at Simon & Schuster. Started as a local salesman, worked my way up district manager, regional manager, divisional manager, national sales manager. At that time, I distributed Ballantyne. I was the sales manager for Ian and Betty as I said, launching these great fantasy books. Went on to be a publisher of uh, paperbacks at Grosset and Dunlap, where I began publishing fantasy and science fiction, which I loved in the YA line. Brought in a, uh, a really great editor, Harriet McDougall, to be my editor-in-chief at Tempo. We did well enough so they bought us Ace to play with. So we got to be publisher and editor-in-chief of Tempo and Ace and the other grass of paperbacks. That grew well enough so that I could go to venture capital and borrow the money to start Tor. The way this gets back to what John asked, I had three ideas. People were telling me in those days, you can't start a new mass market company. You know, there were, there were essentially five mass market companies that dominated the market. Mass market sales were much bigger than hardcover sales in those days. Uh, over 100,000 retailers sold mass market. But mass market licensed from hardcover. 
And the author sold to the hardcover publisher, and the hardcover publisher licensed the mass paperback publisher and split his royalties. Half, he kept half because it was his product which he was licensing, the publisher, the author got half. It seemed to me that it was possible to compete with the big guys if you had some ideas on how you could have economies that they didn't have. First off, do books hard and soft. Don't license from anybody. Give the author the full royalty out of the paperback. That would make it attractive to the author. Secondly, I'd grown up in sales. Growing up in sales, nobody follow, follows the salesman around to see did he work nine to five. They judge productivity. I didn't see any particular reason why an editor had to uh, work in a New York office. I wanted to create a company where if they wanted to work there, they could. If they wanted to work someplace else, they could work someplace else too. That's how I got Robert Jordan. My editorial director at Ace and at Tempo was, a, as I said, a brilliant editor. Uh, before she acquired Jordan, she acquired Ender's Game, for example. It's a great classic now in the field, which sold over a million copies last year. We published it in 85. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is great backlist. Anyway, <laughs> Harriet got divorced. She was working for me. After the divorce, she was living in a walk up in, off Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. Shortly thereafter, her dad died. Her mother had already died. Her dad died and left her this marvelous house in Charleston, South Carolina. It had been in the family from the mother's side ever since the Revolution. It had a 500-foot walled garden downtown. The father was admiral of the Atlantic Fleet out of the naval base in Charleston. So she grew up kind of a southern princess. Anyway. She inherited the house. The father had felt a certain noblesse oblige to the old family retainers and left the money for the maiden, the cook, and the gardener to work as long as they should wish. Somehow, for some strange reason, Harriet thought it might be nicer to bring her five-year-old up in those circumstances than in the walk up in Brooklyn. <laughs> she, she moved south. I couldn't lose her. I said, Harriet, look, you'll be our southern editor. You'll work out of Charleston. You'll come to New York when you want to, to meet with agents, but we've got an 800 number. We'll get you a computer and a modem. That's how we talked in those days. <laughs> you know, you send in your copy that way. You'll be my southern editor. She went to Charleston. She had shopped in a bookstore there all her life, you know, since she was a little girl. She knew the bookstore owner. She told the bookstore owner she moved back to Charleston, she was going to start a an office, a, you know, an editorial office for a New York publishing company. The, author, the uh, bookstore owner said, oh, you know, you could do me a favor. I've got this great customer who was just hurt in an accident on an atomic submarine. He was an atomic engineer. He's been given a long leave of absence, and he says what he wants to do is write a book. He's already got a rough of it, which he left with me. Would you take a look at it? And that was Robert Jordan. Uh, Harriet looked at it as a favor. She loved it. It actually uh, wasn't published as Robert Jordan. He had pen names for different categories. This was the Fallon Blood, and it was a historical of the American Revolution. But he couldn't finish his story in one book. It turned out to be a trilogy. So then he said, what I really always have dreamed to do is write a great epic fantasy. And, uh, he said, would you do that? I know it's different, but would you do that? I said, I'd love to. He said, well, uh, OK. He said, uh, I said, but wait a minute, Jim. His name actually was Jim Rigney. Robert Jordan was a pen name. I said, but Jim, you're never going to finish it in one book. He said, well, yeah, you're probably right. It'll probably be a trilogy like the film. Yeah, right. <laughs> 14 books later. <laughs> so this this mention of multiple books, I think, kind of leads into yeah. the next uh, question that we were going to ask. So I have a question that's actually for both of you that's about the, 
I'm curious what you both think about the circulation of stories today in our era of multi-mediation, right? And I think that Song of Ice and Fire is really a key example of that. So not only is it a book series that obviously has been turned into a television series, but there's also you know, a great many other media texts that circulate around it, right? Dictionaries, wikis, maps, music videos, graphic arts, merchandise, et cetera, et cetera. So George, for you, I'm curious about what, do you, what does that mean to you as an author creating a fictional world where that world now exists in multiple forms? And then, you know, and, and of those multiple forms, I'm particularly curious to know what you think about the fan forms, fan rewritings, appropriations, remixing. So what does it mean for you as an author? And Tom, for you, uh, when George is done, the question I have for you is what does it mean for you as a publisher? What does it mean for publishing as an industry while, where now, you know, the text is not the only version that, you know, amongst all these other circulations and media productions? Well, it's, a, it's been an interesting experience, to, to say the least. I mean, when most of my career, um, writing books like The Armageddon Rag and Fever Dream and Dying of Light before that, or all of my short stories did, there was no secondary rights. There was no subsidiary rights. Um, occasionally, I would get a movie option, you know, most of which just paid me some money and they held the rights for a year or two and then you'd never see a movie or something. I did occasionally get something filmed. My novella Night Flyers was made into a, a film at one point. Uh, I had a, a story called uh, Remembering Melody that would, became an episode of The Hitchhiker. So occasionally something came through, but there were no other rights beside that. But then with, with uh, when Game of Thrones started becoming popular, Song of Ice and Fire, suddenly I started getting these uh, offers that I had never had before for, from various people who wanted to do replica swords or miniature figurines or, um, you know, Comical. various types of games, uh, role-playing games, paper and pen role-playing games and um, video games and uh, just a bewildering number of things. And uh, I remember having through a period where I said, well, I don't know if I want to take any of these things. Some of them seem kind of tawdry. I, you know, I, I'm a serious writer, you know. Would F. Scott Fitzgerald have ever uh, <laughs> had bobblehead dolls? Uh, <laughs> and then I thought about it a little. I said, you know, from what I know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, he would have sold bobblehead dolls in a minute if they offered him any money for that. So he and uh, Zelda could have continued to party. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I signed these various contracts, and uh, um, I think they've both they've been good and bad things about it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be just a guy who who signs a signs a contract, cashes the check. I wanted to make sure that if I, I was going to do these products, that they were good products, that they were true to the mm -hmm. material. So. Initially, I wrote in a lot of approvals to all of these things, that they could, they could do the game or they could do the whatever it is, but I would have to approve everything. And that sounds good in theory, but of course what it led to me spending a lot of time approving stuff, and, and not only approving, but giving notes on stuff. Uh, and I was probably a little obsessive about it at first, and it, it wound up taking a lot of my time. So I, I, I still don't want to let crappy products get out there, but I, I have pulled back a little on the approvals now that I know some of my licensees and who I can trust and who I can't trust. But the good part is that I discovered that there's an enormous synchronicity here yeah. because I, I've, my readership started to build yeah. from people coming in from other avenues saying, I'd never heard of your series, but I played the, the role-playing game, yeah. and uh, I loved the role-playing game. I thought I'd better look up the books, or, you know, I collected miniature figures and paint them, and I saw your figures that Dark Sword was doing, and I decided I'd better look up the books. So I was getting new readers from, from all of these things. It did cause a bit of a bump, uh, you know, with the uh, HBO deal, which came along a few years later. 
because uh, you know, customarily when you sell the rights to a TV or film company, they get all the merchandising rights. So HBO was saying, well, well here's the deal, and, and we get all the merchandising rights. I said, I can't give you all the merchandising uh -huh. rights. I've already sold it to these other people. And what do you mean? We, we always get all the merchandising rights. And you know, it, it wound up for a time that it was, looked like the whole deal was going to fall apart because you know, even if I wanted to give them the merchandising rights, I couldn't because I had pre-existing contracts. But thankfully, my lawyers and agents were finally able to, to iron that out. But it was a ludicrous, but what do you ludicrous think? negotiation at point where it's saying, yes, well, we'll give you keychains, but we keep bobblehead dolls. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going through all of that with the, uh, with the agent. Uh, and, and now that HBO is going, of course, uh, the, the, I still have the old contracts that are, that are grandfathered in. Um, that are still direct to me, but everything that's not under contract went right. to HBO. So now there's just a flood of merchandising coming out because nobody knows how to merchandise like a television network or a, or a, a film studio. So there, there are new products coming out all the time, including some I never would have thought, like oh. our own beer. I mean, it's great. We have our own beer. It's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> what do you think about the ones that are not officially licensed? Again, like the fan appropriations and fan art, fan stories, fan rewriting. I, I've long been an opponent of fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, th I th and let me define fan fiction very precisely here, because sometimes I get criticized by people saying, you wrote fan fiction when you were young and now you criticize it, how dare you? I wrote what we called fan fiction in the 60s in comic fandom, but that was simply fiction written by fans right. and, and published without any money. Uh, and I certainly did a lot of that, but I never borrowed anybody else's character or world. I, I invented, I didn't, you know, I was a comic fan. I didn't write about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. I, I created my own heroes, uh, you know, and wrote about them. The White Raider and Manta Ray and Garazan the Mechanical Warrior and all that stuff I was writing when I was 14 and 15. But they were my own characters and my own stories. What fan fiction has come to mean is writing Star Wars stories or writing Star Trek stories or, or writing, you know, slash fiction, which is, uh, you know, taking, taking characters and putting them together in, in unlikely sexual situations. Uh, uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me, so I, if, if people want to do that, fine, but don't, don't send it to me and expect me to prove it or something. Now, fan art, that's, that's fine, that's a whole, whole other thing. Um, fan art is great, and people do send me links to that all the time. Uh, some of this you just have to, what you want to do for your own amusement is great, yeah. but you can't start selling it on eBay or, or merchandising it, because yeah. then it, you'll get sued, if not by me, you'll get sued by one of my multiple makers of bobblehead dolls or, or figurines <laughs> because you'll be moving into John's one of the areas right. that they're paying me good money to, uh, to be into. Right. So. And Tom, did you have a quick follow-up to that about what it means for the publishing industry now that, again, texts circulate beyond the actual books that you're selling? Well, I, I basically agree with George that his ideas are his ideas. Somebody, you know, his characters are his characters. Uh, for us, it doesn't have much effect because none of it is very powerful. Some of it creates good publicity and some of it is annoying, but frankly, we don't pay a whole heck of a lot of attention to it. Uh-huh, okay, to you. In that same LA Times article, George, the writer says, Martin, and this is, a, I wasn't gonna go here, but you mentioned F. Scott Fitzgerald and uh, you know, kind of a bobblehead for uh, Gatsby. Martin transports us back to the halls of power. And that's why A Song of Fire and Ice often feels less like a, san a fantasy saga and more like Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals. How much has history influenced your writing um, in this series? Well, it's, it's influenced hugely. I mean, I, history was my minor in college. I've always loved uh, reading history. Um, particularly medieval history, but I, I also read a lot of ancient history and occasionally other periods. Um, it's especially cool to read history about countries and times that I know nothing about, uh, rather than the, you know, the same old stories that we're taught uh, all through high school and college and such. Um, 
But one of the things I wanted to do when I started writing this series was to weld the, the, uh, the wonder and, and imagination of the, of the very best fantasy and, and science fiction with some of the grittiness of historical fiction. In addition to history, I read a lot of historical fiction. And um, for me, it fulfills some of the same stuff of fantasies. It takes us to another place, another time, a place where mores were different. Um, and yet, in historical fiction, there's this uh, a sense of realism that uh, I found very attractive. Uh, and I'm a huge Tolkien fan. Certainly, he was a giant influence over me. Um, but fantasy in, in the hands of the imitators who followed Tolkien, I think, had kind of lost its way. They were, they were taking a lot of Tolkien's tropes and just repeating them. And they didn't have, Tolkien was a real scholar and, and a linguist and uh, an expert in folklore and ancient languages. And he brought all of this considerable learning to it. That wasn't true of the Tolkien imitators. They were taking just the broadest, you know, castles and knights and, and, and dark lords and stuff from Tolkien and producing this stuff that seemed to be me to be set in the Disneyland Middle Ages uh, rather than anything approximating the real Middle Ages. So. So history, you know, was, was huge for me. And as I read a lot of history, you know, uh, there's that famous quote that if you steal from one person is plagiarism, if you steal from many people is research. Uh, <laughs> I, I stole from many people reading a lot of history and I, I would say to my wife as I read some of these histories, you can't make this stuff up. Listen to what happened here. And I'd read some incredible incident and then, you know, I'd file off the serial numbers and uh, change a few things and uh, do a version of that for my books. So something like the Red Wedding, as I've said in other interviews, was very much inspired by the Black Dinner of Scotland and the Glencoe Massacre, both from Scotland. Scotland has a lot of incredibly bloody history, uh, which is uh, particularly particularly good. Of course, the War of Roses was a huge influence over everything, the Hundreds Years War. Um, all of that was, was grist for the mill. So in addition to historical references, do you believe, do you also think of uh, Song of Ice and Fire as, uh, as kind of relating to current? Does it function not only as historical reference in some ways, but political allegory, right, in the way that your work deals with issues of, you know, war and peace, uh, family loyalties or national divisions. How do you, you know, and there is a long history of science fiction and fantasy functioning as sort of historical allegory, political allegory. Do you, do you think your work functions in that way? Well, I, I think some of that is probably there, but it's not necessarily there deliberately. I, I think you're obviously you're influenced as a writer by the world you live in and uh, the things you see on the news and, and the forces that have shaped you from your childhood to that, all of that goes in and it comes out in some ways. But I'm not writing conscious allegory. Mm -hmm. Tolkien was accused of that, of course. It always made him very angry because he mm -hmm. hated allegory. Um, but, you know, he, when people said, well, the Lord of the Rings is an allegory for World War II, he, he rejected it vehemently. Um, but there's no doubt that I think some of that, um, mm -hmm. some of that is there. Yeah, some of this is just universal concerns. I mean, I'm writing about power, I'm writing about right. governance, I'm writing about war. Um, Yes, there are differences, but the things that are true about the war in Iraq are also true about Caesar's invasion of Gaul and, and Alexander's conquest of Persia. There are certain universals that, that, that go all through history, and uh, those are inevitably present. Mm -hmm. You know, Tom, you've spoken often, when I've heard you speak, about the importance about a, of having a fascination with telling the tales of, quote, prehistory. And this ties in exactly with, 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 where we're go with what this is about. Um, can you, what does prehistory mean? And, and a follow-up before I even, with, with that in mind, is you've also spoken frequently about the importance of Westerns to the form, <laughs> the basic shoot 'em up Western, cre helping to create the form of the fantasy novel sci and science fiction. Could you talk about both the importance of prehistory and the influence of, of these and, and one genre and how it's affected these other genres. Well, actually, when I started Tor, I wanted to 
create a publishing company, which I uh, defined as uh, novels of history, past, present, and future. I thought of it as the broadest kind of science fiction. And it seemed to me that archaeology and anthropology were clearly sciences, and that when you sent uh, novels 25,000 years ago, based on the best archaeological, anthropological knowledge, you were doing science fiction. We did the classic science fiction set in the future. We did hard science fiction, which was basically defined as science-based science fiction. We're doing it now with NASA. NASA uh, mm. gives us ideas, and we bring great storytellers, and we create what I hope is great hard science, science fiction. But that was near future science fiction because it was things that we could extrapolate from what we know. And we found that uh, Tom Clancy was setting action on a satellite in Cardinal of the Kremlin and selling more than we were selling on the kind of science fiction we were putting in similar periods. And we thought, well, OK, maybe some of this we should call techno thriller <laughs> because that was what seemed to be fashionable. So we called some of this techno thriller because it fit. It was the same kind of thing that, that Michael Crichton was doing as a techno thriller, for example. But techno thriller leads you back to thriller. The prehistory leads you forward. One of the classic areas of science fiction is first contact. In science fiction, that's normally considered to be first contact between human and alien. It could also, the editor who feels very comfortable with that, it's how civilizations radically different, how they meet, how they interact. That can also be applied to Stone Age North American and Industrial European. The story of the past leads you forward, just as the science fiction led us to techno thriller, led us to thriller, which took us back to World War II. The prehistory led us into first contact led us into historicals, led us up to World War II, where they merged. Much of it, though, was still science fiction, because this is the kind of fiction we were trying to uh, publish. Mm -hmm. So my next question, again, to George is, kind of continues on the issue of the political implications. So for all the enormous interest and lauding of your work, certainly deservedly so, there have also been some critiques, I'm sure you know, of the series, by which I mean both the book series and the TV series, political and social implications. Now, in many ways, we could say that the series really kind of undermine traditional notions of power, that, that they really, in some ways, very much play with, you know, as we've talked about, about phallic constructions of power, kind of subverting it. But at the same time, you know, there has been some critique of the works in terms of issues of gender and sexuality and race. So, for example, with the TV series, it even led to the, con the coinage of a new term, sex position, Right, which people talk about it, kind of laugh about the way that sometimes there'll be uh, these scenes with, with sexual activity or nudity to kind of prevent the information of narrative, kind of narrative information from seeming boring, that you have the sex going on. So some people say, okay, so women and sexual minorities are there for just kind of titillation purposes and not much else. And there have also been some critique of some of the racial tropes, for instance, using the trope of the kind of white savior of dark people, like in the case of Daenerys Targaryen. So I'm curious, do you think that these critiques are justified? How do you respond to those critiques? Well, you're, that question covers a lot of territory. Uh, you could talk to the professor here. <laughs> there, there are. Uh, let me try to separate that into component parts here. First of all, you have to separate the books from the television right. show. They're, they're, they're two different things. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very, uh, very, very clear, as in the case of uh, this white savior business right. with the, the scene with Daenerys 
um, where she is uh, hailed by the, uh, the slaves that she's just freed in the city of Yunkai. Um, that scene is drawn largely from the books, but in the, in the books, I, I think I make it very clear that uh, the slavery of uh, Slaver's Bay of Yunkai and Astapur and Marine is not racially based. Mm -hmm. It's not American um, slavery, uh, which was strictly race-based. It's modeled much more on the, the slavery of the ancient Near East of the Romans and the, and the Greeks. Uh, where slaves could be of any race, um, you know, it could just be the guys who lost the last war. Um, you know, the Greeks enslaved each other. You know, if Thebes defeated Athens in a war, a bunch of Athenians would suddenly be slaves and Thebes, and vice versa. Um, the Romans conquered people of various colors in Africa and and very different colors and colors in Germany and Gaul, and made slaves of them all. Um, and that's certainly what I depict in the books. Uh, and I think that's what is meant to be depicted in the TV show, too. But there are practicalities with running a TV show. Mm -hmm. those, those scenes were filmed in Morocco. Um, and the people that you see are extras mm -hmm. who are paid, you know, $30 a day or something like that to, uh, to perform. Um, just to be in the background. Um, when you film that, you, the practicalities are you put out a call for extras and mm -hmm. people show up and, uh, and you sign up as many as you need. Um, when you do that in Morocco, Moroccans show up okay. and... <laughs> So I, I don't know what the, I mean, the, the, obviously there's an implication there that uh, people took of it, perhaps people who had not read the books, yeah. um, that all of the people that she freed were, were brown or black, and that yeah. certainly not the, was not intended to be the case. But yeah. on the other hand, flying in people from, uh, um, from Ireland to, in order to yeah. people this scene in Morocco just to stand in the crowd would have been uh, very, very cost prohibitive. Yeah. These are the kind of practicalities of television yeah. uh, production that's, that some critics never take into advantage. I mean, if you look at the Dothraki, for example, we, we filmed these Dothraki scenes with Daenerys in a number of different places. And, you know, like some of the early scenes, our, our main location is Belfast in Northern Ireland, and we film in areas around Belfast. Now, Danny in particular has filmed scenes in Morocco, in Malta. Uh, she's filming some in Spain right now. We, we move around, um, but some of the early Dothraki scenes when she was first with Khal Drogo were actually filmed in, in the fields outside Belfast in Northern Ireland yeah. in, in forests and grasslands. And if you look at those closely, there's a lot of kind of pasty white Dothraki yeah. uh, <laughs> because those are the guys who showed up when we put a yeah. casting call. Yeah. Hey, do you have long hair? Can you ride a horse? And, uh, you know, you hire who you show up. And with uh, gen I mean, that scene, you know, with, with Daenerys too, I mean, it ties to the gender issues. I know what you're saying about the differences between the TV show and the book, that it's very different, let's say, the issues of sexual violence that are in the TV program are not like the scene, you know, that is not a rape of, of Danny in, in your book. And I know that, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying about that, that, that between the difference between the television and, but as, a, you know, but you're also an executive producer of the TV series. Do you have, can you kind of ha negotiate those things with them? Or, you know, how does that work to say, I, I don't like the way you're, you're translating this? You know, I'm involved in a television show, but it's, it's really run by David Benioff and, and mm -hmm. Dan Weiss. Um, you know, and I don't consult every day. I'm not, I'm not in Belfast. I'm, I'm uh, mm -hmm. you know, in Santa Fe trying to, half a world away trying to finish my books. So I do consult with them. They, we talk regularly. They sometimes ask my opinions and sometimes they don't. Um, but I don't think in, the, in that particular case I would have done anything different. I mean, they, frankly, it, I don't even think I realized there was a problem there until people started pointing out there was a problem. Maybe that's my blindness or the blindness of David and Dan, but it was just, 
you know, the practicalities if you're going to do that scene. I mean, how do you, how do you get that? Where, where do you get the, the mixed racial things when you're trying to hire a thousand extras for a scene mm -hmm. and you're doing it yeah. in Morocco? I, I, I don't know, you know, do you use CGI to, to change their complexion or uh, mm -hmm. do, you know, do you say we have enough brown people, sorry, we're not hiring any more of you brown people, uh, you know, people. Uh, only white people should, I, I don't know, I don't know how you, how you do that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe there is a better way, and we should have thought about it more, but uh, I don't know that. Now, let me go to another part of that question, which is the sex position question. That was a, that was a very <laughs> cool uh, coinage, mm -hmm. uh, which was coined by, uh, I think it was Miles Nutt, yes, the critic Miles Nutt, yeah. for referring to a, one particular scene. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it was probably justified for that particular scene. Littlefinger is giving a long speech in the brothel, and meanwhile there's, there's right. a, a couple girls getting it on in the background. And, uh, <laughs> and it was parodied on Saturday Night Live and all that. But I, I do think that, like many of these tropes that uh, Odie's Cornish has come forward, it's, it's been ma vastly misused. People who don't seem to un actually understand the scene have started applying it to any scene that has sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think sexuality is sex position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s sex position was that one particular right. thing where they're trying to put something, um, I guess, visually interesting on, on, right. on the scene while, they're, while someone is delivering, a, you know, a long nugget of uh, backstory. Right. Um, George, let me, let, let me come at this from a different way because there's another side to your characters, another side to what you're doing. As you illuminate in your Rolling Stone interview from, a, from maybe about a year ago, you deride the fact that fantasy is mostly inundated with evil, ugly, dark lords who, who go to battle with dashing, brave heroes. And you've kind of turned that paradigm upside down. I'm going to have a follow-up to Tom on this in a second. Your books feature a dwarf as, as a major character, if not the, the sole, the most reasonable voice, a disabled boy, um, many of the characters, uh, a, a prostitute plays, uh, several seem to be wise and heroic. You have a character who commits in the first book and the first season of the show an irredeemable act who is now in the, since he's lost a, a limb, is becoming almost I, I, I hesitate to say heroic, and yet that's what it is. Um, you seem to have changed the nature of heroism as it has been traditionally defined in fantasy and science fiction. Is that something you set out to do consciously, or did, just, did, or did it evolve? Did characters like Tyrion Bran um, and Jamie Lannister, did they just evolve organically? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I've always been attracted to great characters. Um, I think they're more interesting than, uh, than heroes, you know, who are just going around being heroic all the time. Is that why, by taking Jamie's hand away, he becomes a more sympathetic character and, and seeks redemption instead of continuing on the path he was on before? Well, he certainly has to redefine himself, and, and in that comes a lot of personal anguish and, and personal growth and personal struggle, all of which is, you know, great material for, uh, for drama. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up as a comic book fan, as I mentioned. That was my, my first stuff was publishing comic fanzines. And uh, a huge influence on me when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old was, was uh, Stan Lee and the Marvel comics. And that was one of the things he did, you know. I'd, I'd been reading DC Comics for years when Marvel started, and the, the DC stories were all completely circular, you know. Was, Batman was swinging around Gotham City, and you know, here comes the Riddler or the Joker, and he defeats the Riddler and the Joker, and they go in, but there's never any surprises. The story ends right where it begins, so next week he can deal with Poison Ivy or whatever. And um, you always knew who the heroes were, you always knew who the villains were. Um, and Stan Lee th threw all that out. He, That's right. He, 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 you know, the Fantastic Four, what a revelation that was in 1961. You know, one of, one of the guys on the team was a monster. And he didn't like being a monster. And he was angry at the other people on the team. They were fighting within each other, just as Lee never fought within each other. And I discovered, really, the, the powers of conflict and the powers of 
great characters, and they continue to, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings, and I think Boromir is my favorite character. He's the one who, who succumbs, you know? He's a mm. hero, but he's also fatally flawed, and, uh, you know, he, he fails at the last moment, and, and, you know, you're rooting for him, but then, uh, and Peter Jackson did a great job in the movie, we're showing his temptation, you really, really like Boromir, but, you know, then he turns against Frodo, corrupted by the ring, but then he dies so heroically, full of arrows, yeah. Sean Bean dying one of his many deaths. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I love to write about characters like that, and intellectually, I always, I also, I also find the question of, of redemption fascinating. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not religious now, but I was raised a Catholic, so maybe it's, maybe it's uh, questions that, I, uh, that come to me from my whole Catholic upbringing and the, the things I learned from uh, nice. Sister Mary Elephant or something in catechism. I, I mean, you know, the, the whole question of forgiveness for sin, you know, that the Catholic Church teaches you go to confession and you are forgiven for your sins, even terrible sins. Um, but certainly our society doesn't necessarily that's necessarily deal with that. Uh, we, we, we don't forgive people, even I don't forgive people. I recognize, you know, I'm a great character myself here, I, you know. As some of you know, follow my, my uh, blog, I'm a, I'm a football fan, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Giants and the Jets, but it, it bothers me that Michael Vick is on, my, is on my Jets team, and I know he's paid his debt to society and all that, but I can't just bring myself to root for this guy. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and then um, people yeah. say, well, what about your belief in redemption? Well, yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's still, it's hard, it's hard. You know, Tom, the, the, the characters I mentioned who are, are actually survivors, in, yeah. and they're in every book. That's what these three characters of Jamie Lannister, Ty, the, you know, Tyrion Lannister and Bran, that's what they have in common. Talk about, in publishing, why a series like Wheel of Time or Song of, of Ice and Fire uh, is, is the direction authors often go in. Well, I, I think that uh, quest and heroic quest is a rough background, but that people get involved with the characters. When interesting characters are created, people want more of them. They want to spend more time with them because they are interesting. And as they spend more time with them, you know, you'd rather spend time with your friends than with strangers. As you spend more time with people and become more involved in their thinking, you become yourself involved with where the story goes. And you want to spend more time there, which means you want to read the next book, which is, of course, what publishers and authors would like, that we would involve you, that we would engage you, that we would bring you forward to the things that we were going to do next. Mm -hmm. So the last question sort of for both of you. So over this conversation, you know, we've ranged over a lot of topics about the kind of multimediations of going on in today's world, about the way in which the, the, uh, the books are, re relate to certain historical issues, political issues, you were talking about spiritual issues. So in some ways, the way they open up new ways of, of thinking about things, both the books and the TV program. So I'm curious to hear from both of you about what do you think, in, in what ways are they kind of maintaining older models? In what ways in today's world do you think new ideas are being produced through your work? And for you, Tom, in what way is, is a kind of new things happening in publishing? That, that allow people to think about even literature differently today? Well, I mean, we're certainly living in interesting times for, for storytellers. Um, you know, in terms of the film and television, I think this is the true golden age of television, even much more so than the early 50s, which is often called the golden age of television. There's, there's never been so many great television shows on, uh, you know, and thanks to cable and the proliferation of channels, it's changed radically from even when I was most active in television in the 80s and 90s. But even as it's flowering, it may be in the process of dying. We don't know what effect uh, Netflix 
and uh, you know, cable delivery systems, Amazon is getting into it, Hulu is getting into it. Everybody's making uh, dramas of some sort, and do you even call them television if they're not broadcast or cable cast uh, if they're only available through purchase on computer things? We have web series. Uh, who the hell knows where it's going to, uh, going to end up? But to my mind, uh, all of these things are, are about story. Um, you know, Dangerous Women, uh, the anthology that uh, uh, we're, we're giving away here is uh, Gardner Dose One. I did that. That's one of my cross genre anthologies. I've always been uh, kind of an opponent of uh, <coughs> strict genre classifications that bedevil the industry now. Uh, maybe because when I was growing up in New Jersey, I didn't, I didn't have a bookstore. I had a spinner rack at a local candy store where all the books were jumbled up together. So, you know. Um, the science fiction books were next to the mystery books, were next to the collections of Shakespeare, were next to the non-fiction books about how to win friends and influence people. Everything was, there were nurse novels and gothics. It was all mixed up together. And I mostly bought science fiction fantasy, but sometimes I buy one of those other things. I read widely, and I think that's the way we should do it. Now we've got bookstores and publishing is all sliced up into these genre things. Uh, you know, here's the science fiction side. Some people never leave the science fiction or fantasy section. And, and Dangerous Women has, has uh, science fiction fantasy in it, but also has mystery stories and mainstream stories and historical fiction uh, all about dangerous women. Um, so very broad theme and all that. And I, I wanted to shake people up and get them out of their categories. Um, and one of my mantras has always been uh, what William Faulkner said uh, when he was given the Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. And I believe that, and I think that, that transcends genre. Um, it's stories about the human heart and conflict itself. It doesn't matter if it's ha a mainstream literary fiction, which I consider itself a genre, or, or it's a mystery, or it's a science fiction or fantasy, whether it has spaceships in it, or dragons in it. The good stories are about the human heart and conflict with itself. I think that's also true when we're talking about delivery systems. I don't care if it's on cable, if it's on Netflix, if it's a, a movie, if it's a television show, if it's a radio play, if it's a live stage play. All of this can be a vehicle for telling stories. And if we tell a powerful story uh, with real characters that affects people, that it makes them laugh and makes them cry, and that, that they remember, uh, you know, 10 years after they read it, that's, that's what I want to do. And I, I think the delivery systems have changed before. Uh, as we were talking about at dinner, vaudeville died. It was once the thriving part of the American scene. Uh, radio drama died, but new things came forward to replace that. And you know, will will television die as as we know it? I don't I don't know. Maybe the networks will die. <laughs> I think they're a little looking a little sickly, to tell you the truth. Um, they they still have the biggest audiences, but. They're not doing cutting edge work anymore. Cable and now Netflix are doing the shows that people are talking about and people are excited about. And that may be where the creative heart ends. But it all remains to be seen. And you know, Tom, uh, of course, is closer to the, to the business side of all of this as, as I do. And all the things are, of course, are businesses. And they're all driven by the fact that they have to make a profit at some level. So uh, when they stop making a profit, like vaudeville, then they go away. Uh, so. What's well, going to survive? I hope books survive because I love books. Yeah. Uh, that will always be, despite my television film experience. Yeah. And even new delivery systems like Kindle, uh, I, I love my physical books. So, um, Tom. Tom, do you want to do you want to add to that to, about the the state of publishing now and where you see that yeah, going? Well, and then we'll end with that and go to questions. I agree with George. I mean, first comes the story. Powerful characters that involve you, that draw you in, that make you want to spend time with them. The reason for the labeling, and you know, I, as I said before, I was trying to define science fiction pretty broadly when I said I was publishing science fiction from the future to the prehistory. Still, uh, labeling helps people to find what they want. There are an awful lot of trees in the forest. One of the problems with the internet is that there is just too much out there that is not good. There's a lot that's good too, but 
it's hard to find. The internet isn't easy to browse. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you know what you want, you can get it. No bookstore could carry all the backlist of a publisher, but you could get it on the internet, and that's great. But the problem is that uh, you got to know what you want. If you don't know what you want, you're not going to have a very happy time. Now, how do you begin to know what you want? How do you find the first George Martin? This is what a publisher tries to do. He, he tries to, you know, the labels are, I understand George's objection to the labels, but the labels are devices to kind of point somebody in the right direction. And if we label truly and package truly, our covers ought to be representative of what's in the book. They're small, they're small ads. They're not, uh, they're not really illuminations of the text. But they ought to be honest ads which show you this is what we think this book is about. If you're looking for it, here it is. Now our problem today, George was saying when he was young what he, where he found his book was on this wire spinner rack. This was a wonderful device to sample the public. There were over 100,000 retailers with wire spinner racks in, 19, in the 1950s when I got into publishing. Over 100,000. There weren't, when Ian Ballantyne got into publishing, he said, said there weren't 500, he said this to me, I never tried to verify it, but he said there weren't 500 bookstores in the uh, continent, in the entire North American continent that he could regularly sell. So what we were doing is we were getting through these mass market books, we were getting a sample out <laughs> where a person could taste it could decide what they like at a price that most people could afford. We would look at surveys, Gallup, Nielsen, which for years said, this is how you got people into bookstores. When they were satisfied often enough in an impulse situation, waiting you know, for a prescription in a drugstore, buying from a revolving rack, going down a supermarket aisle to buy a pound of coffee and buying from a rack in the, an eight foot section in the supermarket. When you satisfied them in those in those uh, conditions, then they knew that what they wanted, and they began to go to places where they could get what they wanted. But the sampling was very important. Now, what, what our problem is today is that we have lost a substantial part of those 100,000 retailers. As we move into the internet, which is a wonderful thing in and of itself, and the ebook is a wonderful thing. We have uh, given people, <laughs> I guess what we would call it is, is instant gratification. They don't have to wait for a cheaper edition. Most of my life in publishing, you had to wait a year to get the reprint of the $25 hardcover. You waited a year to get the inexpensive paperback. If you buy a computer today, you can buy it next year cheaper and probably better. If you buy a fall fashion, it'll be on uh, sale on tables in the spring. This is how most business works, most merchandising works. But with ebooks, you get instant low price and instant gratification. Nobody has to wait any longer. So what this does is it gets books that people want to them very, very quickly. But it undermines the distribution system. It undermines when Amazon can run ads saying, go to your local bookstore, look at the book, and then check on your uh, phone and see, uh, we'll beat their prices. <laughs> They're not paying for that display. And you know, we've lost the Waldens, the Daltons, all the mall stores, the Crowns, the Laureates. All these impulse opportunities, along with these wire racks, which are so seldom there anymore. And it means we have a hard time introducing new authors. We have a much easier time selling established authors because people know they want them. But the new author, the very talented youngster who's coming into the market with a great story, it's so hard to get him to the audience that would appreciate him. 
And so these are our challenges. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've got a wonderful plus here, but we've got a minus over there that is kind of balancing it. Mm -hmm. So where are we uh, as a business? About where we were, but I worry going into the future if we can't establish young authors. <laughs> Where is the future? We've got to be able to introduce people to the best that is coming in, into, uh, into books. Yeah. What a perfect way to finish. Yeah. So he was, you were just speaking about you know, people don't like to wait. I know a lot of you have been waiting with your own <laughs> questions. So first of all, please help me thank our guests for this part. Now we're going to move into hearing your questions, so let me just give you some parameters. First of all, I know there's some questions that are on your mind that I'm going to answer for you very quickly, so you don't have to bother George with them. His favorite character is Tyrion. <laughs> the next book is going to come out when the next book comes out, so please don't pressure him. And the characters will continue as they, as he sees fit for them to continue. So again, please don't pressure him about that. Um, so the way we're going to handle the questions is there are microphones on either side. If people could please line up behind the microphones. What we were sort of... Actually, I should, try to I should talk about the next book. I should tell you that uh, uh, I actually have three books coming out this month, so uh, none of them are the winds of winter. But uh, <laughs> we do have uh, The Ice Dragon, uh, which uh, my, my children children's book, uh, which has an older book, but it's just been reissued by Tor in hardcover. Beautiful new edition with artwork by Louis Royale, and that came out a couple days ago. And the Dangerous Women paperback, the first volume, because it's a really big book in hardcover, that comes out uh, when? That comes out in a few days, right? Actually, that is shipping now. It will be shipping in some now. stores. Okay. <laughs> and then on October 28th, uh, The World of Ice and Fire comes out, a giant heavily illustrated coffee table book from Bantam Spectra, hardcover, um, with all of the background and information about Westeros, art on every page, gorgeous art, and uh, tons of uh, history uh, about... You can read the Armageddon Rag. And yeah, you can read the Armageddon Rag, too. You can be one of the 12. <laughs> so no, that's in print now. All my old books have come back in print, so uh, you can get them. But they're not coming out this month. So what we wanted to do to try, because I know a lot of people have questions. So first of all, try to keep your questions relatively brief. What we wanted to do was hear, a question, hear questions from both sides. In other words, you ask and you ask. So they hear both questions. Starks, because, Lannisters. <laughs> because sometimes Lannisters. No other way. <laughs> All right, we'll let it start. So we're going to hear both questions first because sometimes questions sure. overlap and then they'll no, answer and then we'll move on. So, Lannister. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, have you or yeah? Have you um, read anything that made you think differently about fantasy or science fiction, either or both? Okay. And your question would be. And my question is: You have such a brilliantly realized world, but. You've also called yourself more of a gardener as a writer, so I guess my question is, how much of Westeros was planned as a setting prior to even the beginning of the first draft? Uh, almost none. I mean, when that first chapter came to me, I, I didn't know what I had. I knew it didn't fit the, the science fiction novel I was presently writing. Um, so I knew it was in some fantasy, but I didn't have a name for it, and I, I didn't know anything. But I continued to write the first few chapters. At some point, I stopped and drew, drew a map. That's kind of, I knew when I was doomed, uh, when I drew the first map. But uh, I am a gardener rather than an architect, and, and uh, the, the world has grown together with the, with the story. Um, there are times I almost wish, uh, some of you have probably read Gene Wolfe, the absolutely brilliant science fiction and fantasy writer from, from Chicago, author of the, uh, the oh, many books, Book of the New Sun, and uh, was one of his best, and that started as a trilogy, ended up in four books. I was in a writer's group with Gene when he was writing that, and Gene had a full-time job as an as a editor for a, a technical magazine. And he wrote all four of those books in first draft before he submitted any of it to the publisher. And then having finished all four books, he went back and 
revise the first one, you know, put in some foreshadowing of things that had happened in the fourth book that he didn't know when he was writing the first book, eliminating loose ends that led nowhere, you know, just making them, and that's really the way to write a long series, but, uh, you know, and, and as part of me that, you know, if I had, if I had been a billionaire with a huge trust fund, uh, I might have done that, but then none of you would have read any of the books because I'd, I'd still be working in book five and Game of Thrones wouldn't be released yet because I'd be holding it to go back uh, when I finished all seven. So, uh, you know, but it, it grows, it, for me it grows, the world grows along with the stuff. I did have to, when putting together this world book, The World of Ice and Fire, uh, really focus in and I invented a lot of new material for that, a lot of background that the, uh, the fans and readers had sent me emails and letters about, you guys are insatiable. I mean, it's, it, it's <laughs> like, you know, I, I do a family tree with like eight generations and then like a week later I get, well, who was, the, who was the father before that first generation? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, am I supposed to go back to the West Coast, Adam and Eve? I don't know, I guess so, but. <laughs> and did, did, yeah. Um, did, did you have an answer for, did, did you want to reiterate? Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Have you read anything, both of you, um, that uh, made you think differently about fantasy? Um, I've read a lot of great fantasy. I think this is a golden age for, uh, for fantasy. I mean, uh, we have a lot of wonderful new fantasists. Daniel Abraham with the dagger and the coin, Patrick Rothfuss, Scott Lynch, uh, Joe Abercrombie. These are all writers that I really, really, really like and, and uh, admire. Um, so they're doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, Tom, and from your from Tor, any great new fantasy writers from Tor? Well, I think Brandon Sanderson. We uh, asked him to finish after Robert Jordan died. We asked him to finish the Wheel of Time. He worked from Jordan's notes, extensive notes. He worked with Jordan's wife, who was Jordan's editor. But uh, he finished it brilliantly. He's got his own. Uh, Stormlight Archives, which he is now developing. And the first book in that uh, series that he did after finishing the Jordan was a number one New York Times bestseller. We, we think he's got an amazing future. Great. One of the, one of the interesting things that's happening in, in uh, both fantasy and science fiction right now um, is we're, we're seeing a lot of new writers coming into the field. Um, who are from a different cultural and ethnic background. Uh, you know, people who are Asian or African American or, or just African or, or um, you know, from many different cultures. And they're drawing on, you know, it's often been pointed that a lot of epic fantasy has its roots, like Tolkien, in, in the European Middle Ages or the European Dark Ages. And that's certainly been true of the overwhelming amount of material. But I, I think that's starting to break down and we're, we're getting some interesting books by some interesting writers. Look at the people being nominated for the Campbell Award the last few years, uh, much broader. So we're getting more diversity into the field. Now, whether that is going to succeed or not, um, some of that's up to the writers and how good those books are, but a lot of it's also up to you. Um, you know, are you going to support these writers? Are you going to buy their books and review their books and, mm -hmm. and uh, create the, the blurb about their books? And if so, we're going to have an explosion, I think, of, of fantasy that's uh, much, more, much more diverse and, and maybe it won't seem quite so familiar. I mean, I, I base my work on the history that I knew, the history that I was taught and that I'd read numerous about, like War of the Roses and all that. I don't know a huge amount about Asian history. Um, someone coming in, drawing from a Japanese perspective or an Indian perspective, uh, um, would produce something very different. And I, I look forward to reading books like that. And I think we're gonna we're gonna get a lot more of that moving forward. All right. All right let's hear Thank the next you. set of questions from the next people. The Starks in the land. The Starks. Hi. Um... After having worked on the TV series, do you find that when you're writing, you, you have images from the show of what the characters look like or the places look like, or is it entirely separate in your mind? That's a great question. And your question would be? Um, my question was, you admitted you really like your great characters. I was wondering if it's easy for you as an author to kind of kill off or let go of black oh. and white characters. <laughs> They're pure good or pure evil. Are they somehow a little bit uh, easier to maybe write and easier to bump right. off? Great. Those are kind of connected. Want to get both of those? 
Um, I, I, I do get attached to my characters, and sometimes it is hard to kill them off. Uh, I've, I've said before that the Red Wedding was the hardest thing I ever wrote. I finished that entire book, and I had to skip over that chapter. I couldn't write that chapter until the rest of the book was finished. Wow. I, okay, now I got to go back and finally write that chapter, and I, I made myself write it, but it was painful. These mm -hmm. characters assume a certain reality to me, mm -hmm. and on the same token there, uh, no, the TV show does not affect my images of the characters. I recognize that it does so for you, for you, the readers and the viewers. Uh, you probably see, when you read the books, you see Peter Dinklage, when you read Tyrion, you see Maisie Williams when you read Arya, and they're both sensational at their parts, as are many of our cast. But you gotta remember, I've been living with these characters since um, 1991, and we had the first meeting about the TV show in 2007, so there were, there were 16 years that I was living and writing about these characters in that world before the TV show was even a, a, a twinkle in, in the eye of HBO, so uh, that's too deeply rooted to replace it for me. Great. All right, next up, folks. Yeah, um, so one of the most great and terrible things about A Song of Ice and Fire is its unpredictability. So how has the expanded reader base affected your ability to keep up uh, that sense of excitement or um, sort of the ability to predict or not predict things that are going to happen in the series? And for, for George, I know you don't, uh, directly or involved with the, the goings on with the show right now, but I just wanted to get your opinion on exactly how the show has deviated from your own writings and how well you think that should continue or not continue. I always think of Tyrion's nose when, I, when, I, when someone asks that question. So that predictable. Tyrion's nose is a good example. I mean, yeah, they didn't cut off his nose. Uh, I, I can write that, you know, that, Yes, and they cut off his nose, and then I can make references in the subsequent books to him having half a nose or having a big scar and to how it itches and he scratches it. That's relatively easy for me to do. Actually, cutting off Peter Dinklage's nose uh, was prohibited by the Actors Guild. Uh, <laughs> so we were, we were stuck with, uh, well, if we wanted to do that, we would have to essentially put a piece of green screen, uh, a little green uh, kind of thing on the end of his nose that he would have to wear in all of his scenes, and then we could CGI every moment he appeared, uh, you know, the, the nose scar, um, and that was just way too expensive. Yes. I mean, it's the practicalities of, uh, yeah. uh, of doing it again. Uh, you know, a lot of the changes that occur between a, a movie or a television show or book are, are dictated by practical considerations like that, questions of budget and shooting time and what can be done and uh, what, what can't be done. Um, and I'm already forgetting the other question. I'm sorry, my mind is a sieve here. How the expanded reader base has affected your ability to write things that are unpredictable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure it's the expanded reader base that has uh, affected things so much as the internet. But basically, I have, to, I have to divorce myself from the internet. I mean, I know it's out there, and I know people have theories, and sometimes at venues like this, people come up and tell me their theories. Uh, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, when you're, when you're, when you're writing a, a book, um, you know, that has any kind of surprises or mysteries, you know, you lay in certain clues that, let us say, the butler did it. And um, it's a long series. You, you lay in the clues in the first one, and you have more clues, and maybe a few red herrings and subsequent ones. Mm -hmm. And most readers will not miss that. They will, they will not figure out who did it. They will not even be cognizant there's a mystery, or they will put together the clues wrong. But there will always be some, and this has always been true, there will always be some who put the clues together and figure out that the butler did it. What's changed in the eyes of the internet is now that smart ass feels that they can go on the internet and say, oh, here are the seven clues that I found and see the butler did it. <laughs> so if you're a writer and you're aware of that, then you have, what do you do? Now your surprise is ruined because suddenly this person has put it out and now thousands of people have read it. And they're all saying, oh yeah, you're right, I didn't see that, but yeah, the butler did do it. 
So you can change the subsequent books, oh, and the butler didn't do it now. Now the, the chambermaid did it, but, but then all your clues that you put in so carefully in the first and second book lead to nowhere, and they're, they're, they're contradictions. So I, I don't do that. I, you know, I'm sorry, but the butler is still going to do it at the end, and some people will have figured that out. I think, and other people who didn't figure it out will know it because they read it on the internet in one of these theory swapping things. And there's no help for that. Uh, there's a structure to the things that you have to be true to. Um, I console myself in the fact that I, I do have millions of readers, and as, as big and noisy as the internet seems, it's still relatively small in the cosmic theme of things. So there will be, at the end, there will still be many, many thousands of people who will be shocked to find out that the butler did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next set. Uh, this one is also for George. Um, whenever you, <laughs> sorry. Um, we whenever some questions for Tom here. <laughs> He's getting off easy. <laughs> um, right, some Tom folks come up and get in line. Whenever you, um, if you do, hit bumps in the road or roadblocks with character plots or like traits or whatever, um, how much of that do you draw from your personal life in order to create a more in-depth character or scene or relationship? Okay, yours is. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire is a very, very long, well, it's a fairly long-running series of very long novels, and people who read these, who have been reading these novels since the beginning have developed a kind of a feeling, I feel they must have developed a, series, a feeling of trust that you're going to be leading them to somewhere that ultimately has a very good payoff. Do you feel that with the immense number of people you kill per book, that you could violate that trust? <laughs> immense. So those go together, you know, in terms of the pers your personal experiences and then also the personal feelings of the readers, so. Well, I hope I don't violate that trust, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've kind of become accustomed to the fact that some people probably will think I have by the time we reach the end. You know, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of a, of a, of a long-running series like this when, you know, people start noticing it with the first book or the second book or the third book and then, then they love those books and the fourth book's not out yet and they start anticipating the fourth book and they, this platonic ideal of what that fourth book is going to be develops in their head and then they get the actual fourth book and many people are happy with it but then there's always going to be a percentage of readers who are not happy with it because it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go or it wasn't as, as whatever it was they thought it was so you, you inevitably come come on that with the series. But I certainly want to try to uh, stick the ending as, uh, as best I can. Um, it's not easy. I mean, I'm not going to name names here, but we, over dinner we were discussing some other writers and, and you know, some very, very good writers have a real problem with endings. Endings can be, can be tough, you know, especially for big, sprawling things. You pull out a lot of stuff. As for the question about, uh, yes, um, you do draw on your personal experience to make characters come alive to, to some extent. Um, that's, that's where the inner life comes from. That, that's where the human heart and conflict with self comes from. Um, I was very threatened as a kid uh, when I knew I wanted to be a writer by the stuff you always read in like how to write books and things like only write about what you know. <laughs> Um, because I wanted to write science fiction and fantasy, and I, I didn't really know about being a prince or an astronaut or, you know, I was this kid from New Jersey, and we, we, we were poor, we didn't even own a car. I, I, my, my world was five blocks long, and I was saying, oh God, do I have to write about a guy who lives in Bayonne and the projects and walks to school every day five blocks long? But um, what I discovered is that what you know it's not the mundane details of uh, you know where you live and and what it is, but it's it's what you know is about life, about love, about about uh, heroism and cowardice and and these issues. Uh, what it's like to be human and and you have to you have to draw on yourself to do that. Yeah, you draw on other things too. You read you read you know characters from history and you read people in the news and you have friends and relatives and guys guys you went to school with. 
and girls you went to school with, and you can base characters on all of them to some extent, at least externally, but you only know those people, unless you're a telepath, and, and you don't look like a telepath to me. You, you don't really know what's going beyond the, behind these, these masks. The only one you really know is yourself. And, uh, you know, I think to be a significant writer, there's a, a you have to be willing to kind of expose yourself and, and uh, dig, dig deep and, you know, as Harlan Ellison would say, bleed on the paper or something like that. And that's a lesson I learned early on that's, uh, that stood me in, in good stead. Um, I write a lot of, about a lot of characters and none of them are kids from Bayonne. Uh, so obviously I'm not writing about what I know in that sense. I, I, I've never been an exiled princess. I've never been a eight-year-old girl. I've never been a dwarf. Um, but there's a lot of me in all those characters. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think what would, what would it be like if I was an eight-year-old girl in Arya's situation? What would it be like if I was, if I was Daenerys Targaryen or Tyrion Lannister? How would it feel? And I, I do put a lot of myself into that. Thank you. Okay, so next set, uh, can I just say too, if anybody has a question for Tom, come to the front of the line. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> um, before I ask my question, Mr. Martin, I'd really like to thank you for writing the books. They've had a huge impact on my life, Mom. So thank you. Um, my question is, how do you think that the success of the entire A Song of Ice and Fire universe has influenced the way that you're writing the future books? Okay. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one's really quick. Um, first, what are your favorite house words? Um, and then also, um, I assume you quickly developed a final outcome for the story after originally creating it. Uh, but at some points, you also made changes like uh, the inclusion of like a five-year gap. Um, so I was wondering if there were any other major deviations or character choices that you made and later thought better of. Uh, my favorite house words are definitely winter is coming. That's the one I... I write, uh, you know, repeatedly uh, when I'm uh, when I used to do inscriptions uh, on signed books. Um, I haven't actually gotten to the end yet, so I don't know if there are going to be other major changes. It's it's possible, but I, I don't. I think the broad outlines are going to remain the same. You know, I I know where some of the major characters are going, how they're going to end up, how it's going to resolve. But there are, uh, the devil is in the details, and there's a lot of stuff that occurs when you're actually writing the, the books. I don't know, you, you dealt with some of this, uh, um, um, you and Harriet, with, with Jordan, I'm sure. Uh, Jim always said that he, he knew the last scene yep. uh, when, he, wow. when he started. So did. Did he entrust that to Harriet, and did Brandon write the last scene that, that uh, Jim had originally envisioned? Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. And that was like 20 years later, right? 20 years later. But of course, then he was thinking it was going to be a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm You're already sorry. forgetting the first question. Yeah. I, I keep forgetting there's two questions at a time. I, I'm old and, and feeble, so. <laughs> How do you that? think the uh, success of the entire universe has influenced the way that you write the future novels? Um, I don't think it's influenced the way I write the future novels, but it's, it, it's certainly been a distraction. I probably would have written the novels faster if I wasn't like always approving things or going on tours or uh, you know doing coming to Brown doing other coming to Brown uh, yeah <laughs> to to do that I mean there's just there's just a lot of other things and you know some of it is is good stuff it's stuff I enjoy enjoy doing I know there's a subset of my fans that would like to just chain me to the typewriter uh, <laughs> And if no one was giving me awards or in offering me free trips to, to Dubai and, and uh, South Africa, maybe, you know, maybe I would do that. But at, when I actually settle down and, and write you know, between these trips here, and I mean, I'm trying to, I swear I'm trying to cut down on all of this. But when I'm actually there writing, um, it, it's, it's like time vanishes. And I'm, I'm, back, I'm back once again in, in uh, Westeros. And, the real world disappears, and uh, days and weeks go by, and I, I don't do anything else except live and breathe those characters, and it's, that's still pretty much the same process. Everything vanishes, including the show. As uh, much as I love the show, it's, it's different from the books, and um, 
so it's the books and the, the characters as I interpreted them that take over my life. So I know many of you, excuse me, have uh, questions, and I hope that you'll come to the reception at Sales Hall uh, next door. Uh, George and Tom will be joining us for the reception, but they will not be signing books. Uh, please join me in thanking our guests and our interviewers.